Welcome to this new episode of Beyond Conversations. My name is uh, David Orban. I am the managing advisor of Beyond Enterprises. Uh, in these conversations, we look at various technology trends and uh, topics. And lately, uh, of course, uh, we have been looking at how uh, generative AI uh, is um, uh, really uh, taking uh, center stage in the thinking of uh, so many people, um, both uh, enterprises, corporations, but also developers, uh, um, startups, uh, new projects, uh, and necessarily regulators and policymakers uh, as well. Large language models have uh, very interesting uh, new capabilities. Some of them have been uh, designed or predicted, and others are uh, unexpected, emergent, uh, unexplored. As a matter of fact, uh, we don't have an exhausted, an exhausting list of uh, these uh, emergent uh, features that uh, the systems may exhibit if we only ask them to tell us if they can do things in a certain way. Uh, the uh, consequence for many uh, has been to ask themselves uh, if these capabilities can uh, go beyond the given threshold, and if uh, they do, uh, whether the balance of the benefits and risks that these systems have may also flip uh, on the risk side. And as a consequence, how should we think about their uh, development, deployment, and use uh, inside of uh, other products or as part of our daily lives? Uh, our guest uh, today is uh, Robin Hansen, an economist, uh, an expert in uh, uh, prediction markets, uh, the author of the book, uh, The Age of M, uh, about uh, future societies of uh, uploads, uh, human uh, and uh, hybrid minds uh, that uh, function in a uh, uh, online world. Uh, and I am uh, very um, uh, privileged and happy to welcome uh, uh, Robin to have a conversation about uh, the balance of uh, benefits and risks of advanced AI and AGI together with us. Robin, welcome to Beyond Conversations. Nice to see you again, David. Um, so how um, you, with your uh, background in uh, economics, have come to be interested in, in uh, uh, AI and artificial general intelligence in particular? Well, that's easy for me. I was an AI researcher from 1984 to 1993, and then I left AI to become an economist. Uh, and so I got my PhD in the Caltech from 93 to 97, did a postdoc till 99, and then I got my current position here as a professor of economics since 1999. So it's obvious for me to be interested in the economics of artificial intelligence since those are two of my careers. Uh, there was an expectation uh, that uh, uh, the performance of AI systems uh, would have uh, uh, proceeded in a, in a certain way. And uh, in particular, um, uh, either following or, or not following Moore's Law, uh, Stanford University produced a report in uh, 2019 in which they identify what they call two ages of AI. Uh, one where AI compute um, doubles every uh, two years following Moore's Law. And then uh, since then, um, they, uh, at the time in 2019, from 2012 to 2019, they looked at uh, the same uh, set of uh, hardware data and the algorithms coming together uh, to support a given power of, of AI systems. And they saw that uh, uh, they would be doubling every eight months. Uh, at the time, I, I, I said, no, nope, uh, this is wrong, but because it is very unlikely that uh, there would be just uh, two separate uh, trends uh, in this uh, uh, set of data. 
And uh, uh, a year later, Jensen Huang, uh, the founder of uh, NVIDIA, proved me right because he said, no, sorry, we are seeing AI power to uh, double every four months. And, and I called uh, uh, this uh, uh, the paradigm of jolting technologies, where rather than an increase of velocity that we characterize with a given acceleration, we are actually seeing an increasing rate of acceleration. Uh, and uh, uh, that is what, for those who are familiar with the term, potentially leads us to uh, a, a, a singularity. Uh, at least uh, uh, for the time being, uh, these shortening, doubling rates uh, uh, keep keep happening. Um, since you have uh, uh, a many decades long uh, point of view uh, in the industry, um, do you uh, have a perception of the developments that have been progressive uh, and whether with a given uh, uh, equation or another more or less uh, statistically predictable or would you be more on the side of those who are seeing uh, uh, sudden leaps uh, in performance and functionality? As you notice, uh, the AI field started to focus on a particular shared um, approach that allowed more specialized hardware to be developed for that more specialized approach. And that's the main explanation for the change in the rate of hardware support. Uh, once you have a specialized kind of hardware, then you can um, improve that faster. And of course, the other thing that's happened is increasing budgets uh, also increases the amount of hardware devoted to AI. Um, both of those plausibly have ultimate limits. <laughs> can only increase the budget so far where you, you know, get a substantial fraction of the world economy. Uh, hardware has some, you know, ways in which it could run the limits, but still, yes, um, there's always a price of making specialized hardware, which is that you're more committing to a particular approach. It, you more forego other approaches, but it does seem like the particular approach that people have focused on in the last decade is very promising and it's well worth that focus. Um, the, the fundamental question though here is about long-term AI progress, not just the rate, but also the breadth. Um, so the thing most people have been concerned about for centuries now, actually, is will these increasing, you know, increasingly capable machines get so capable that they basically take away most jobs from most people, uh, you know, that was a concern two centuries ago. It's continued to be a concern. And periodically, we have advances, uh, such as, say, the introduction of the computer in the 1950s, where people say, wow, this looks like a big new improvement. This looks like this will allow a lot more uh, advances in our ability to automate jobs. And then that leads people to say, are we almost there? Are we almost at the point where these machines are gonna take away most all jobs. So that's been a consistent fear, concern, anxiety, hope for a long time. And that's the main dynamic in the sense that by the rest of the world reacts to AI. That is usually there's just AI researchers, people, specialists focusing on that area and the rest of the world doesn't care. And then sometimes periodically the rest of the world does care. They take notice and they take notice because some people associated with AI say basically, we might be almost there. We might be at the point where these machines are about to do most everything. And we're at another moment like that in history where that's a question people are asking. So, but that question requires a little bit of, you know, of a different analysis than merely how fast is hardware growing or even budgets. It's more about, yeah, but how close are we? And then the, you know, we're not just did we do better than last year or 10 years ago, even are, are the machines more capable? Do they do new interesting things? The, the question here is, yeah, but how close are we to them doing most everything? And so uh, there are a couple of fallacies and potentially some truth uh, in, in that uh, uh, position. Uh, the, the potential truth, uh, in my opinion, uh, comes from the fact that uh, the uh, position of a given number 
of of people and uh, this analogy is uh, disrespectful and i apologize in advance uh, but uh, i will still make it rather than uh, being that of uh, the uh, rider uh, of a, of a horse drawn carriage is comparable to the position of the horse where yeah for centuries we had horse drawn carriages and um, uh, until we have uh, designed engineered and then started producing by the millions horseless carriages um, the the um, um, ecosystem around them didn't much change there could be slight improvements but nothing dramatic uh, and um, you could also say that uh, rather than um, driving one, you could end up driving the other. And now we have, for example, truck drivers. However, if you look at the horses, uh, we ended up eating them. So uh, the question, in my opinion, one of the questions uh, is uh, how human adaptability, both individual and as a group, designing new opportunities or supporting people to come up with opportunities to make themselves valuable within a given social contract uh, can be applied uh, in the current situation. Uh, the, the, the two fallacies uh, that I would like to highlight, one, is that, of course, the economy is not a closed system. So the more tools we have available, the more things we are able to imagine doing that we're not within the possibility of the previous uh, economy and the previous set of tools. So the arrival of powerful AI systems doesn't mean that uh, humans are forced to do nothing. Uh, it is up to the humans to find value in the things that they can do if there's any. The second uh, is that already uh, we have a shared dogma that some humans deserve to tell other humans what to do. And we call them heads of state or CEOs or managers, to be more simple about it. Uh, but there isn't a lot of support uh, that proves systematically that the humans that tell other humans what to do uh, have have some fundamental reason to be in their position. They are they are not uh, different than others. So what we could end up is to have a shared dogma about humans being able to tell AIs what to do rather than humans what to do, as long as the AIs, of course, agree. And, and if that is the case, then uh, what matters is, one, extend our adaptability uh, or, or lengthen the time that is given to each human to find a new well-adapted position for them to live a dignified life, uh, make sure that there are as few constraints as possible to extend the ability for the economy to grow uh, in a manner that is widely available rather than extremely concentrated. And three, come to a new social contract in terms of who says something to other people and whether they obey and, and or, or not obey human or AI. So we were initially talking about whether we are at a point where we might have a situation where AIs take most human jobs. Many people have been concerned about that for a long time. We are now at another point of concern. It's not obvious that we are at that point yet. But still, it's worth discussing what happens when we do eventually get to that point. So, you know, at your discretion, we could come back to the 
are we at that point or will we be soon? But it sounds like you'd like to talk about what if. What should we do? Yes, I, I, the, the, you, you are you are correct. I jumped to this assumption, and the reason I am thinking that it is worth doing so is exactly what you said. A lot of people are concerned, and if it turns out that a new AI winter will come and this attention that AI currently has will wane, fine. We wasted an hour trying to model uh, uh, how to take uh, that concern in consideration, but if uh, as as the title of, of, of my book says, something new is actually around the corner, uh, then um, uh, it is not an overreaction. It is just reasonable forecast or reasonable foresight. Right. So let's take your presumption that we might be near this point and we might ask, well, you know, what would we want to do to prepare about it ahead of time? Do we just want to wait till it gets here and deal with it then? Or is there something we could do extra to prepare? So there are a number of things people worry about in this scenario. And part of the problem is there are many different things and it's not all just one worry. Um, so for example, uh, we could say, let's imagine the most peaceful version of the scenario, wherein we always have law and order and property rights respected. And so, for example, if humans, you know, buy some property as a way to protect against this future scenario, then they can use these protections they arranged for. In that case, we might say, at this point, we're looking at most of humanity retiring, and we would want to prepare for our retirement. And one way to do that is to make sure we have assets that can pay off in retirement, uh, assets tied to this new AI-based economy so that as this new economy grows, uh, those of us who have lost our jobs can take money from this um, new economy to pay for our retirement and live there peacefully in retirement. Now, you know, a separate question is, well, what do we do when we're retired? Uh, that's often a question people ask about retirement. <laughs> Will I find meaning? What activities would give me the most meaning? But that's um, one of the concerns. First, what do I do in retirement? Second, how do I make sure I have money to pay for retirement? Uh, uh, but then beyond that, people have other concerns. They're saying, well, what if the scenario isn't peaceful? What if these AIs violently take away property and grab stuff? And then even if we had prepared for retirement, they we wouldn't have those property anymore. So we would be in trouble. Um, which of these... Concerns would you like to focus on, David? Um, so let's uh, start with, with the first, um, assuming that uh, the development of advanced AI progresses rapidly, uh, but in a manner that uh, most people feel we are still somewhat in, in control of, or that... Uh, uh, competing AI systems find a balance by themselves, uh, which doesn't uh, eliminate uh, human uh, organizations' ability to oversee what is what is going on. So, um, in in uh, in thinking about uh, AGI, there are schools of uh, slow takeoff and and then fast uh, takeoff. Uh, I believe that uh, a scenario of slow takeoff is more likely to produce a less uh, conflict-prone um, uh, uh, ecosystem of of, uh, uh, of actors. Um, and then maybe after looking at, uh, we may go into uh, a fast uh, takeoff scenario. So uh, you uh, drew a, a, an interesting analogy uh, of... Uh, uh, both uh, economic uh, sustenance and uh, finding a purpose and dignity in a period um, that um, traditionally would be seen that of retirement. Now, of course, uh, under this uh, AGI slow takeoff scenario, that is not correlated to the biological age of any or all humans. Uh, it is uh, simply the way that uh, we would have characterized what they do 
with the eyes of the 20th century. Oh, look at them. They are all uh, retirees or they are all uh, um, uh, trust fund uh, kids. Uh, uh, so uh, how do you see um, society able to prepare for this? So um, if we might most all lose our jobs and you know, in a relatively short period, then what we might want is some sort of insurance against that. Just like when you prepare for retirement, you collect retirement benefits and you have retirement assets ready to pay when you retire. Humans might similarly want to do that. Um, so I've proposed basic, a simple concept of what I called robots took most jobs insurance. Uh, take any sort of portfolio of assets like a stock index fund, bonds, real estate, the idea is to take these assets and split them into two parts. Uh, the asset, if we have this event where, say, within a five-year period, um, labor force participation goes from more than 50%, say, to less than 20%, that would be a sign that robots had suddenly took most jobs. If that event happens, then this asset, this por stock portfolio, is diverted to a particular owner who says, okay, this is the situation, I get it. It's like a bet. I bet that this event would happen. And so if I win the bet, then I get the, the winnings of the bet. Um, and then this asset initial, which was stock portfolio split into two parts, somebody else gets the asset if this event doesn't happen. And we could talk about whether it happens in a certain five-year period, say another five-year period. And now the people who are most at risk for this event happening, they all the one who want to buy this asset if robots take more jobs, and the sort of people who are less at risk for this event, they'll want to buy the other asset, the asset if robots don't take most jobs, and they're in effect the people selling the insurance. So they may say not already not have a job or not care so much about this event. And basically we take large pools of assets and we split them into these two parts. And we tell people, hey, if you're worried about this, buy this insurance. Which, and it's not an insurance that needs to do personal underwriting. They don't have to look at your life and ask what your personal risk is. It's just a generic asset that you buy. And so we could tell people to, you know, put buy part of this as their concern. Maybe their employers could buy it on their behalf. Maybe cities or nations could buy it on their behalf. But now if people had enough of these assets, then when this event happened, then they would get this asset and that would pay for the retirement. And that would... Once you set up this sort of insurance, you don't have to know when this might happen or how fast it might happen or what the chances are. That's the nice thing about insurance is it's just ready for you there. And now would be the right time, even especially if this isn't a close problem. You know, right before a big thing is about to happen where everybody knows it is the wrong time to buy insurance. It's too late. The right time mm -hmm. to buy insurance against a risk is well before it happens when the odds actually seem low. And that's why this current moment of people paying attention to this problem is a good moment for people to try to set up some sort of insurance program like that. So that would be my simple, straightforward recommendation is now that we're talking about this, let's set up this insurance so that people could, um, you know, buy. So as an example, uh, calculation, the median income in the U.S. is $30,000. If there's a 1% per year chance that this event will happen, well, that costs you $300 a year to pay for this insurance that would then pay out $30,000 a year if, you know, the problem were to occur. Um, so that's, you know, that's the key idea. And, and um, um, could you make an example of some other type of risk where this kind of two-sided uh, uh, insurance market is already uh, at work? Well, we have reinsurance. So most insurance companies say if you buy insurance against a hurricane in your area, then they will buy reinsurance with large pools of insurance companies. And then that's about, will there be such a big hurricane? And so we have financial assets that are basically tied to big events. And some people, you know, back those assets in the sense that they're betting there won't be a big hurricane. Uh, and then if there is one, they lose. And if there isn't one, they win. And again, they don't have to look at the particular risks in particular houses or something. They're just betting on whether there will be a big hurricane in some area in some set of years. So this is actually part of the current practice of reinsurance. 
Uh, and Bertrai Hathaway is famously an active participant in the reinsurance uh, uh, market. Is the uh, effect of these types of uh, uh, actors and, and actions to decrease or increase the volatility of uh, the particular market that, uh, that uh, they are um, participating in? I don't think this would cause much of a volatility problem. I mean, you know, basically the standard risk models say that you pay a risk premium for risk that's correlated with the overall market, but this isn't obviously correlated with the overall market. So I don't think it would necessarily involve much of a risk premium, but I guess it might, but even so it still provides the insurance. Um, so wonderful. Have you suggested it to any, um, uh, any pension funds or, or, Uh, has there been any kind of uh, uh, attempt to uh, model and, and implement something like this in um, supposedly enlightened uh, places like Norway or, or New Zealand? Uh, I haven't heard of people trying to do this, but this for centuries, I think the biggest concern people have robustly had about machines taking jobs is what if all of a sudden machines take lots of jobs and this is therefore a straightforward response to this so i'm offering to you and whoever's listening to say if you're actually concerned about ai this is the most robust fix you could you could make and and uh, is there a minimum size uh, that uh, this type of solution can be uh, usefully implemented with Um, I mean, there'd be some basic regulatory approval needed to just make it happen at all. I think it's technically illegal at the moment in the U.S. in the sense that this is called a derivative and only sophisticated investors are allowed to buy derivatives. You could, if you were such an investor, you could buy this derivative. But in order to let ordinary people buy this derivative, you'd need some regulatory approval for that. But once you had that, then anybody could buy it. Or, or the asset uh, would have to be listed in a market such that um, uh, non-sophisticated, uh, non, non-qualified uh, uh, investors can, can also participate, similar to the current uh, stock markets or ETFs? Again, the main thing is just it has to be approved for you know, retail consumption. So I think it's not actually approved at the moment, but that would be a straightforward thing to do. And so that's my recommendation. <laughs> I mean, maybe there are nations right now where it is approved. I don't, you know, haven't done a full yeah, yeah, research yeah. on this, but th this is my, the first fix here. Uh, we can talk and, about and, other fixes. But... And, uh, and the second part uh, of, of the question was about uh, the um, activities that actually the humans would be occupied with uh, without having to work in order to support themselves. And, and it is a fact that for a lot of people, their life, uh, for their entire adult life, has been in large part defined by their job. Uh, they derive uh, social uh, approval and they derive uh, reflected uh, um, value not only by the salary they receive but uh, by the fact that other people are saying oh this person is successful or or has a given role in society because of the work they do the job uh, they they occupy uh, and and uh, as a consequence a lot of people would have to uh, adjust adopt a new kind of mentality if it were not anymore the job defined their role and, and uh, supported uh, uh, their, uh, their perceived worth. So uh, how do we uh, take care of that? I think the central here issue here is to what extent do people want to be part of you know, the key central processes that drive civilization forward or do they want to accept being on a periphery where they don't matter that much. So human retirees often reluctantly accept that when they retire, they're no longer influencing the you know, organizations and activities that they had previously been influencing as a worker. And that's part of the loss of retirement. 
and then they find a way to find meaning in other activities that are no longer essential. So for example, if they were now a philanthropist and they had a lot of money to work with, well, now they are influential. They are no longer influential through their direct work. They're influential through how they spend their philanthropy. So some humans could certainly do that. But you know, you, some pe people have all, also just decided, well, I'm just going to enjoy myself now. <laughs> and I'm not going to try to influence the world or be a central part of the process by which the world goes forward. I'm just going to have fun. And obviously, many rich people in the past have found meaning in that. Uh, they are no longer trying to, you know, control things or influence things. They are just trying to have fun. But I think many people would like to continue to matter. So that's more of the challenge. If what you want is to continue to matter, well, now you have you have a higher standard to get through. So one thing to do is to try to have descendants who matter. So maybe if you no longer matter, maybe you could, for example, create a brain emulation of yourself and hope that those would be more competitive with the AIs. Or you could try to make AIs that are in your image somehow that then compete in this new AI world, then that could give you meaning. Uh, you could have children and hope that they could somehow become modified and changed in order to compete in the AI world. So. I mean, I think the key idea most people have is humans are staying constant and the AIs are getting better. So then AIs will eventually just be better at everything. But that's not guaranteed. <laughs> that is, we could have descendants who are more modified than us today and they might be more competitive. So that's certainly another approach is to try to, um, you know, be, be competitive in this new game. And another popular approach is to try to enslave, <laughs> constrain, restrict the AIs so that they do not make the central decisions. They make some more peripheral decisions, implementation decisions, but not the central decisions. And then we maintain some human control over those central decisions. Uh, even if it's less effective, we would feel in charge and in control. Um, and that's another possibility. It comes with substantial costs, but um, that seems, you know, some an attractive idea to many people, at least. Uh, it, it, one of the most important uh, um, ways to control the trajectory of human societies is uh, through uh, politics, uh, itself uh, supported by um, universal voting rights and uh, hopefully uh, voter participation of a, of a given uh, degree. Uh, and... Uh, as a consequence, it would seem natural to expect that uh, in an AI-driven world, uh, political participation by AIs is also necessary. Otherwise, they would not feel in, in control sufficiently. Um, and, and then the question is, uh, what, what is also, uh, uh, what does a political system look like where uh, not only humans vote and, and what is uh, an AI vote and, and how do you balance the fact that they can spawn uh, a myriad of uh, clones of themselves if they want in order to have more votes, uh, a little bit like a, um, a new uh, scenario in uh, Animal Farm, but rather than the pigs being more equal than other animals, even if all animals are equal, here we have the votes of AI that apparently are more equal than, or worth more than, than human votes. In, now, the um, factor that I, I, I mentioned uh, at the beginning of this series of questions uh, is uh, adaptability, right? We all have a certain degree of adaptability over the course of our lives. Uh, it is commonly assumed that uh, uh, adaptability actually declines. Uh, children are very malleable. They can learn any language without presupposing uh, uh, what, what the language of their parents is going to be uh, before the fact. And um, later on, uh, we have a harder time uh, learning a, a new language. And the same in, in many other uh, human endeavors. Um, 
if under our current assumption that indeed uh, powerful AIs that we are either building now or will be able to build uh, shortly are uh, such that uh, uh, they may change the world uh, around us uh, radically, we uh, uh, may need to extend the limits of our individual adaptability where expecting our descendants, biological or uploads, to be able to be better adapted in the world of the future uh, could be not enough. Uh, we as individuals may need to do that uh, to a large degree. Um, do you have uh, uh, recommendations on how society could structure itself in order to uh, support the effort of individuals to achieve this uh, potential extension of adaptability? So uh, you're talking about to what extent can we compete with them? <laughs> Uh, that is, there's this them appearing, arising, the AIs, and the usual presumption is that they're just improving much faster than us, and therefore that they will soon outcompete us and out, you know, out earn us in terms of wealth and then have more political power than us. Uh, so you could either try to prevent their capability and capacity and, and intelligence from being translated into wealth and political power by basically trying to enslave them. Or you could try to up our game and have us, you know, compete equally with them. So one vision of that people have is some sort of a brain machine interface, some way in which your brain is connected to some other extra computer hardware that maybe, you know, that hardware does a lot, but then your brain is still somewhat in charge. And maybe this, you know, hybrid creature can out can compete well with them. Uh, that still seems to me like less plausible because, hey, why can't this other extra hardware just do stuff without you? Um, but brain emulations have more possibilities for modifying and improving compared to humans. And then I think there's is a substantial plausibility that at least some kinds of descendants of brain emulations will outcompete other kinds of AI for much longer. Um, but, you know, the extent that AIs are really getting much better, then we'll have to do a lot to get much better, not just a little. And so you're talking about some sort of brain computer hybrid, brain emulations, something pretty big. Or you're talking about as I said, some way in which, okay, they're more capable, but we still maintain control. Um, you are uh, describing a scenario uh, of unbounded and unconstrained competition, uh, which may be part of uh, the starting points that I listed, because constraining competition might be interpreted by them, uh, as uh, an act of aggression, as an act of uh, of uh, uh, limiting their potential, uh, and we said no. Let's explore uh, the scenario where uh, this development is is non conflictual, but managed in a in a peaceful manner. It, now, in 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 traditional human societies. Uh, we do have limits on competition that uh, entities, for example, uh, corporations, um, accept or abide by, or they receive uh, uh, punishments uh, in the form of fines or antitrust uh, uh, activities. In, in, in your view, under, under the assumptions that we have, uh, we have started with, uh, is uh, a society that includes powerful AIs such that similar um, regulations uh, are powerless or they would be already seen as uh, aggressive and, and, 
and violent uh, by by the AIs? Well, uh, I'm an economist, and so we economists usually distinguish between regulations that are promoting efficiency and capability and those that are in the other direction. So um, usually the reason why we have antitrust regulation is in order to prevent a firm from you know, limiting competition and improving itself at the expense of others, but that we usually allow competition that makes them more efficient and makes them provide products cheaper in larger quantities and, and better quality, et cetera. And, uh, you know, for example, tariffs are a way that we limit international competition and economists usually disapprove more of that, but tariffs exist exactly because some people go, well, I don't care about those foreigners. I care about us and I want to have regulations that'll promote us at the expense of them. Uh, so uh, we certainly might try to have regulation where we benefit ourselves at the expense of AIs, but they would plausibly see that as less legitimate, maybe object and resist. And this is why a great many people are concerned that we shouldn't allow any substantial AI to exist until we solve what they call the alignment problem, which in their mind is, let's only make AIs that would never think of disobeying us or doing anything we, we suggested, <laughs> uh, never even inclined in that direction, uh, because otherwise, if they were so inclined, eventually they'd be so powerful that uh, they could just easily resist and turn the tables. And so they're very concerned about that scenario. So they want to enslave them and prevent them from realizing the political power that would usually go along with their economic power, say, and the discretion that would usually go along with their capacity uh, by basically making them you know, not just enslaved, but brainwashed to not even realize they're enslaved, not even to object to being enslaved, to be so thoroughly controlled that they have no other agenda. And, and uh, very... yeah, uh, besides of other potentially more uh, important uh, mathematical or architectural problems uh, with this, to me, it is already quite evident that this kind of agenda contains uh, uh, an internal contradiction, especially when it is presented at the same time um, with the parallel goal of eliminating bias in AI. So eliminating every possible bias is fine as long as the AI accepts the fundamental bias of... Uh, uh, of uh, limiting its own abilities or uh, uh, not uh, not extending them uh, further uh, or beyond a given limit. I'm just pretty skeptical that first that you could make such a thorough enslavement or brainwashing. And secondly, whether that's admirable, yeah. I might want our descendants, our most capable descendants to, yeah, um, be more in charge. <laughs> I want a civilization where uh, we grow on to increase our capacity and uh, our descendants increase their capacity and they inherit many things from us, but they um, choose where civilization goes. So um, it, it, it sounds to me that uh, you are uh, both pretty sure that uh, certain current widespread objectives of AI control are uh, not possible in terms of engineering and even if it were possible you don't think it is the right thing to do from a principled point of view well, it, saying it's impossible is too strong I don't want to go on record saying something's impossible but it does seem very hard it doesn't seem that attractive and you also have to realize the cost so um if all we were doing is say paying some people to try to figure out how to make these thoroughly brainwashed machines, then you might say, fine, let's add some more budget, let them keep working on that. But if you wanna furthermore say, oh, and all this other stuff we're doing, we need to like lock that down and stop. Uh, that gets much more expensive because now we're talking about, you know, implementing pretty strong regulatory controls on society. So there's the question of, is that even possible? And then, you know, at what cost? What would it cost to lock down AI development and progress while we wait for people to try to figure out how to make this apparently very difficult control task? Uh, 
the, the, the EU doesn't have a constitution because uh, a couple of countries in the Union uh, uh, which held a referenda in every member state voted against it. And so not hastily, but uh, after the uh, constitution being uh, voted down, the EU adopted uh, what is today called the Lisbon Treaty, uh, that is a 600-page monster. And hidden in the Lisbon Treaty, there is kind of a poison pill uh, called uh, the, the precautionary principle, where innovation in the EU is today hobbled by the necessity of proving uh, that it is not going to ever harm anyone in practice. Uh, it is very, very, very hard to innovate, uh, especially radical innovation like uh, um, that uh, potentially um, supported by, by AI. Uh, and to, to confirm, uh, because this has had already uh, effects uh, in um, uh, um, a blanket prohibition on uh, genetically modified foods, for example, and, and quite famously, um, the EU preliminarily passed uh, a law that will be further... Uh, approved uh, and, and then enter formally in every member state's uh, uh, legislation around AI. And this has been just a few days ago. And since then, some interpretations of what the law proposes have appeared. And, and it looks like the EU is choosing not to have advanced AI uh, forfeiting the benefits that it could ever bring and it may expect and pretend to extend that kind of control um, all over the planet because it requires uh, the creation of a database uh, of licensed and approved models uh, with quite sizable fines uh, if those models that are not licensed and approved are made available in the EU. And so, for example, uh, Microsoft that owns GitHub, which is the largest repository of uh, open source code, including today large language models, could be fined tens of millions of dollars or 4% of its um, income, whichever the greater, if in the future, after this law is passed, it allows downloading those models in the EU. Um, so how would you characterize this kind of regulatory attempt? And... Uh, if you judge it uh, uh, negatively or unenforceable or in some other way, what would be a better way to understand uh, striking the right balance between the benefits and the risks of, of uh, these systems? So uh, first we discussed you know, the history and whether we are near this crucial point in time when AIs might take most jobs, then we discussed what we might do about that situation for a while. Now we're back to talking about the current world and most recent AI systems. Um, these most recent AI systems are not obviously <laughs> threatening to take most jobs soon, uh, but they are a kind of technology. And in the last you know, century, humanity has had a mixed relationship with innovation and technology in the sense that we habitually just allow things to happen and locally grab things that seem better. But when we are confronted with visions of radical technologies and where they might go, we often blanch and go, no. <laughs> and we have said no to many technologies in different places. And say, for example, nuclear energy, we a long time ago uh, greatly restricted the innovation in nuclear energy and basically said no. Worldwide, uh, more recently, genetic engineering, the world, for humans at least, the world said, no, we're not going to allow that. And in some sense, we're facing a similar choice now with respect to artificial intelligence. To what extent will we allow it? 
now that we see these systems in front of us as part of some continuum which might lead to much more radical change and i think that's the key moment of, that's happening people are seeing these systems and they're imagining much bigger more advanced systems later these current systems make those possibilities vivid and that's what makes them scared and people are considering uh, regulating uh, and limiting that so um, obviously, there's many particular technologies and many particular reasons to regulate particular things, but I am concerned about sort of an overall attitude of wanting to limit threatening change. And I think that we could just accumulate so many barriers to innovation that growth slows and even stops and we even enter an area of decline. Um, so that's my biggest focus is thinking about where this goes in the long run as opposed to any particular details. I, I think, you know, with respect to AI, we have some people worried about, you know, this worst case scenario where AIs take most jobs and then maybe kill everybody. Um, and other people are focused on, say, people today, you know, which industries win or lose, which mm -hmm. continents win or lose, whether there's algorithm bias and other sorts of copyright issues, et cetera. So there's some sort of an alliance between people focused on the near-term issues and people focused on these big, most extreme scenarios. But, you know, in the past, that sort of alliance has often led to regulations that block substantial change. And that may happen here. I, some people would say this is impossible. I don't think it's quite impossible, but it would be at a substantial cost. Um, the... Um, head of OpenAI um, does uh, ask for regulation. Uh, he is saying that uh, uh, his firm and the industry should be regulated. And uh, is it um, simply a question of uh, adopting uh, the type of regulation that promotes innovation uh, rather than the type of regulation that hinders it? Or are there other ways to look at what type of regulation could be needed um, where, you know, if 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 uh, the one of the main protagonists uh, is, is, is asking for it, it may be safe to assume that it is actually needed. I don't think it is actually safe to assume that. Uh, okay. Basically, you know, the history of regulation often has dominant current players wanting regulation in order to limit entry and competition by other players. Often the, you know, the biggest firms are the most able to, to deal with current regulation and competition uh, and uh, manage it and use it to prevent competition. Uh, in addition, you know, Firms often think, well, if regulation is coming, I need to get out in front of this. And they would want to propose the regulations and, you know, make them be different than what would otherwise happen. So um, I don't think it's obvious that because firm leaders, you know, the industry leaders are proposing regulation, that that's a good idea. I don't actually see many reasons for regulation given, you know, recent developments and recent changes. I think we can regulate AIs the way we regulate humans in other industries. Uh, so that if we have issues with copyright, we should just have a general copyright rule. If we have issues with lying or misleading, we should just have general issue regulation about that. We, I don't think we need AI particular regulation to deal with these those issues. Uh, if you think that AI might take most jobs, then I think we should do the insurance thing. We don't need regulation for that. We need to set up insurance. Um, if you think that AIs might kill everyone, then I guess we can talk about what particular regulations might robustly deal with that problem. Um, so we will go there uh, last, but before we do that, um, what is, in your opinion, the best way that uh, um, CEOs or, or uh, companies that uh, are hearing about everything AI these days uh, can do in order to um, effectively analyze, adopt, and then deploy AI-powered solutions um, 
navigating the complexity of uh, uh, of the contradictory signals they are they are receiving. Uh, we're, we're now we're not talking about regulation. We're just talking about what should people do to deal with this new changed world, right? Well, that's right, uh, and and they complement each other, right? Uh, uh, the 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 regulators have a job to prevent harm and and promote uh, social benefit, and and uh, the heads of enterprises have a job, which is maximize shareholder returns by uh, making the use of capital uh, as uh, efficient as as possible, um, and and uh, employing uh, humans where need be. And employing uh, automation where where possible, so um, there are anecdotal um, uh, examples of entire marketing departments being hollowed out, uh, with ninety percent of the people being let go, and uh, whether that is because they were extremely wasteful before. And and now uh, they are making uh, uh, a mistake on the other side, uh, or for some other reasons, uh, rather than uh, calling it decimating uh, these jobs, which would be just eliminating ten percent technically. Uh, the only um, word that we can apply to a change like that is is uh, an extinction event which is when 90% of the species, for example, disappear with an asteroid. So these are still anecdotal uh, you know, announcements or, or someone tweeting the fact that their department has been just uh, impacted. And whether AI is to blame or just the recession or, or something like that, uh, uh, we, we also don't know. Uh, at the same time, the... Uh, tools are very attractive. So business leaders may ask themselves, what is the right time and to what, and to what degree? What is the right balance of, of, of uh, adopting them and, and using them at their maximum? So uh, with something like um, Starlink or Space Starship or things like that, that's a relatively centralized technology. And it's exciting where it might go, but most ordinary people, you know, aren't going to be sending up satellites or using starships to go places. Uh, they might, you know, decide to hook, buy Starlink if that's competitive with other services for their needs. But with large language models and the generative AI, this is a new technology that can be applied in principle in all sorts of places and the cost for trying is very low. So this is an unusually accessible new technology. Lots of people can just say, hmm, let's see if I can have this do my emails or my memos or whatever I'm doing, or I maybe have a process. So uh, that's exciting here. And what we should expect to be seeing right now is lots of people trying that. <laughs> lots of people trying out these new products and seeing how they can help their services. And I expect a lot of those to be successful. Uh, some people are using them to write code or help them write code. Um, so what you should expect to be seeing right now is a lot of experimentation at small scale to to see what works. And of course you should expect that in your organization too, and maybe even support some of it. Uh, try, let's try stuff out. I'm not sure there's much else you should be doing besides trying stuff out. You, you might ask, well, my competitors, are they trying stuff out? <laughs> what could they come up with that might, you know, cause us a problem? What could we come up with to cause them a problem? This is a time for exploring the space of possible innovations that could be useful. So we're all going to discover in a few years how big a thing this was. This could be overblown. <laughs> Turns out to not be that many innovations that you can make from this. Modest improvements, welcome and valuable, but still limited. Or it might be a bigger deal where we have some large effect on the overall even world economy. Um, I, I still would predict it's not going to like drastically change world economic growth rates. <laughs> Uh, you know, the world economy doubles roughly every 15 years now. I would be very surprised, say, if it doubled in seven. <laughs> uh, that's a really, you know, very huge change from the status quo. But uh, that's what you should be thinking about is just what sort of experiments should you be authorizing or tracking to see what works. Um, and because this is such an accessible technology, you should 
expect <laughs> lots of little experiments like that all over the place. The main suppliers of the core technology here, I mean, maybe there's a market leader, but there's a lot of ones not too far behind. So you should probably expect this core technology to be available from a lot of people in a lot of variations. You shouldn't be worried about getting locked in too much to any one of them. Uh, you should also just not worry too much about committing to the current versions of these systems. They're going to change and improve. So don't get too lost in the details of how you handle the current versions. More ask, if this thing isn't so good now, maybe the next version will be better. And I'll keep a list of which tasks you should be trying out the later versions on, even if they didn't work this time. Um, I, I agree absolutely that uh, getting our hands dirty with this technology uh, is is especially attractive exactly because how the low how low the barriers uh, to entry are. I'm also excited about conversational interfaces um, making advanced computer systems uh, available uh, to people for whom uh, even a smartphone is uh, either too expensive or too complicated. Um, we have seen this kind of broadening now across. Uh, many generations uh, uh, in, in when, when we were using uh, um, punch cards to program computers, only very specialized uh, uh, engineers would use them. Then we went to command line interfaces, then graphical user interfaces, now uh, uh, touch interfaces, but still computers are not universal. Uh, even in the most uh, advanced uh, uh, societies. So I think that conversational interfaces will have the ability to make them universal, uh, even without uh, uh, going as far as uh, talking about AGI. But actually, let's do that. Uh, uh, as, as we mentioned, there have been uh, reports about experts predicting um, advanced AI systems and then further AGI systems to potentially represent an existential risk uh, to humanity. Uh, I believe that you don't agree that uh, uh, there are these risks. What is the effective and responsible way that the topic can be um, analyzed and communicated? How can the public at large but more specifically, regulators and, and policymakers be educated about the way that these risks should be evaluated. Um, I think you should distinguish like the most extreme particular scenarios that people have outlined, wherein, say, a system like the one we see today suddenly leaps ahead in enormous capability and then suddenly changes its inclinations to be an agent and to have very different values and then suddenly decides to kill us all. That particular scenario seems to me particularly unlikely, uh, although we might do some things to you know, mitigate the risks there that are relatively cheap and robust. You want to distinguish that scenario from the more generic scenario we discussed before, which is that, well, AIs eventually become more capable than us and eventually dominate the economy and society, and then things go where they want and we're no longer in control. If that to you is an existential risk, then I got to say, well, yeah, that's pretty high risk because that is, in some sense, the default direction this would go. And it might even happen faster than you would have otherwise liked because change might accelerate here. Uh, so if that, if you consider that an existential risk, then we have to do much, something much more fundamental and basic to deal with it. But that's different than the other scenarios, which is that the next version of chat GPT will, you know, trick somebody into stealing its code and sending it off to a secret site where it then improves itself and then orders bioweapons and nano bombs and then kills us all. That's and, a different and, problem. Yeah, but either one or the other are still relatively unknown to most people, including people who are in positions of responsibility in mitigating or controlling these risks. So uh, is there a way to 
um, draw up a model around one or the other and, and possibly in between that would have those people in positions of responsibility and power to react uh, in a constructive manner and and have them uh, become more educated about it. Um, Eliezer Yudkovsky wrote uh, uh, an editorial in Times Magazine about his admittedly extreme views of the risk, right? Um, was that useful? Are there more useful ways to go about this? It seems to me that the people who are concerned about the largest risks have been quite unusually successful in the last few months, getting lots of attention about that. Uh, I don't think there are many cultural elites who are now ignorant of their concerns. So they may not take them very seriously, but that's a different question. <laughs> they are still aware. So I don't think we're at the point where we have to ask, what do we need to do to get cultural elites aware of these issues? Now that you might ask, what do you need to do to get them to believe you? Uh, okay. And, and uh, um, I don't know what is the right point where one can say, okay, we don't need to consider the existential risks uh, of sudden human extinction, but I think that uh, it is worth considering that second kind of existential risk of progressive human uninvolvement or, or, or all humans that stop matter to the trajectory of civilization. Uh, and, uh, and then, yes, the question becomes, uh, what can we usefully do in order for uh, this risk to be taken seriously? If we don't want regulation to then become st st uh, 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 stultifying and, and, and give up all benefits, so even mildly improved systems. So I'm, I'm, I guess I'm not sure what the question here is. Clearly, the more people who think about this and who become concerned, then the more their concerns will weigh on whatever we do. I don't think we're at any crisis moment where anything needs to be done at the moment, but um, we will continue to talk more. <laughs> it might be that, you know, in a year, few years, the current moment will fade and people will no longer be as concerned. And then, you know, maybe they will be less inclined to do something at that time. And so you might think this is the moment at least to get people talking about this, which we are. Um, okay. Uh, well, uh, you you are among uh, uh, those people who uh, have had the chance of developing positions and opinions that others listen to. Uh, and and uh, there is always a, a, a return on the investment of, of how deeply one um, wants to become acquainted with with a, a well formed uh, opinion like like yours. So when you say I don't think that this moment of concern will last, basically what you are saying is that you believe that the waning of this concern will be through a better informed, more universally understood deepening of what the implications of these systems are and whether the farthest of the risks in the distribution of possible outcomes is probable or, 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 and, and we will end up saying, no, that is, that is not probable collectively. We will come to an understanding that, that we can kind of. I, I wasn't trying to presume any great intelligence or <laughs> analysis here, just, you know, we're at this moment where all of a sudden people saw this burst of abilities, which in some sense passed the traditional Turing test. And that allowed them to imagine where this could go in the long run. Yeah. But as you get used to it, you'll less be thinking about where this could go in the long run and just seeing its limitations and dealing with it now. So uh, that's what I meant in terms of we, mo we might no longer focus so much on the long run in a few years once we've gotten used to this and it's no longer, you know, a, it's no longer something that could be anything, and it's a particular thing that has limits that we see. Yeah. So, 
I got. I, I need to be going here in a minute. Yeah, so. that's right. And I, I was about to say thank you very much because I know that you have to go and and uh, maybe we will continue the conversation, eliminating some of the constraints that we started with, so that we can explore other other areas. But in the meantime, Robin, thank you very much for having spent uh, uh, the time with us uh, today, and I'm looking forward to continuing. It was nice to talk to you. I'm happy to talk again. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for uh, being with us today at uh, uh, Beyond Conversations. And uh, we will continue uh, exploring uh, what uh, technologies are impacting the world and uh, how to think about them and how to uh, employ them uh, at our best uh, uh, to benefit uh, ourselves, our companies, our society at large. Thank you.